Then uh, we had to recover from COVID. And the Prime Minister of Portugal had the support of the European Union, and the European Union printed a lot of money. The United States printed a lot of money, and all developed countries in the world printed a lot of money. I don't think in Kenya there was a possibility to print a lot of money without completely ruining your currency. And when, in the developed world, so much money was printed, that was one, one of the causes, not the most important one, but one of the causes of the progressive rise in inflation that, uh, after the invasion of the Ukraine, became quite dramatic. And when inflation grows, interest rates grow. And when interest rates grow, a country like Kenya has to pay a heavy price. You couldn't print money, but you are paying the consequences, at least partial consequences, and the money that others probably have printed a little bit too much. Then, my dear friend Kristalina Georgieva, that is uh, very concerned with the problems of the countries and the economies at that moment, uh, was able to convince uh, uh, its bo her board uh, and uh, uh, to print, in a different way, uh, the special drawing rights. The special drawing rights, thanks to her initiative, and I'd like to praise her courage, pushing for it, but there was one thing she couldn't change, the rules of distribution. So the Prime Minister of Portugal witnessed that the countries of the European Union, of which Portugal is a member, have received 160 billion US dollars for a population of a little bit less than 500 million people. Kenya, the President of Kenya, your predecessor at the time, uh, was part of an African continent with more than three times, close to three times, the population of the European Union, and that received a total of 34 billion US dollars. And the least developed countries, that represent about 800 million people, almost double the population of the European Union, 17 billion dollars. And we all know that reallocation has been a very complicated thing to put in place. And then, obviously, uh, even if Portugal has a debt that is higher 
as a percentage of GDP than the debt of Kenya, it is still possible uh, for Portugal to go to the uh, markets and get credit in its own currency. With interest rates, I don't know the last figures, but uh, probably around 4%, and for some time below zero. And for several years in the recent crisis, uh, until the last inflation surge, around 1%. I think Kenya has a different story. You have a lower debt as a percent of GDP than Portugal, but the president of Kenya, when he tries to look into how the markets will respond to their need of financing, is much more difficult to find credit and will find it at interest rates much higher. I don't know exactly if it is 12, 13 or 15 percent, but it is much higher. So this is the situation we have in the world. And I compare my own country with your own country. It is clear that my own country benefits from an international financial system and an international financial architecture that is biased, that is dysfunctional, and that is deeply unfair. And so your quest for reform is a perfectly understandable one and something that we must do everything to achieve. By coincidence, by coincidence, we'll be discussing tomorrow afternoon uh, a draft uh, for what uh, I hope uh, will be presented in the next few weeks in uh, the UN to all member states with a policy brief on the reform of the international financial system in the context of preparation of the so-called Summit of the Future or of our common agenda, as, uh, as we name the set of initiatives in which we are involved, covering many other aspects, the digital compact, uh, the problems of uh, the agenda for peace, uh, but uh, a, 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 an essential focus on the questions related to how to address the dramatic structural inequalities that are embedded in the way our financial system is organized. And here, Africa was a double victim of colonialism. First of all, because of colonialism itself. And I'm particularly at ease because I come from a colonialist country. But second, because when the institutions that are today the pillars of multilateralism, the UN, the Bretton Woods institutions were created, the African countries were not yet independent. They were not there. Their voice could not be heard. And so they were not represented, and today they remain dramatically underrepresented and the represented in the UN, where there is still not one single African permanent member of the Security Council, which is something that is profoundly unfair and needs to be corrected, but also clearly underrepresented in the Bretton Woods institutions and other international institutions that were created to manage the global economy. And this, again, is something that a serious effort of reform must be able to correct. And I wanted to tell you that the United Nations is there to represent all nations of the world. But I believe that my role as Secretary General is to assume what is the need to address the dramatic inequalities that exist and to give the Global South the opportunities that the Global South requires in order to be able to catch up as quickly as possible as it is absolutely essential for a matter of justice in our world. And climate change is the best example of that. As you said, Africa had a very small contribution to climate change, but uh, many African countries are in the front line of the impacts floods, droughts, many other aspects. And this is a factor not only of poverty, in some situations of hunger, but a factor of instability. One of the, f one of the reasons why the Sahel has witnessed such a progression of terrorist forces is exactly because of the impacts of climate change. It's not the only reason, but it is an accelerator of all the other reasons that are creating so many uh, factors of instability within the African continent and other parts of the world. 
And indeed, the drama is that independently of everything that is being said, we need to dramatically reduce emissions this decade, and the emissions are still growing. And 80% of the emissions are of G20 countries, developed countries and large emerging economies. It's not Kenya, once again. In this case, Portugal also has a very small contribution. But the truth is, those countries have the responsibility, and it's good to see that Kenya is also ready to assume that responsibility, to dramatically reduce emissions this decade if we want to rescue the planet and if we want to make it still possible to get to an increase of 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. Unfortunately, we are not there. Developed countries are not doing enough. Emerging economies.